A Peltier cell is a component, usually flat in shape, capable of using a voltage to generate a temperature gradient, i.e., decrease the temperature of one of its faces while increasing the temperature of the opposite face. This, thanks to what is known as the Peltier effect. Given these characteristics they are used as cooling systems, or even as a device to generate energy by performing the process in reverse. They are interesting, but it is only a small demonstration of something much bigger. In this video we will talk about the thermoelectric effects, how thermocouples work, and how a Peltier cell works, so prepare your neurons. So that you don't get confused, first I want to clarify several terms that you will surely hear when talking about this type of devices. First, the Seebeck effect, refers to the phenomenon that occurs when a temperature gradient between the junctions of two different materials generates a voltage. Secondly, the Peltier effect refers to the generation of a temperature gradient when a voltage is applied between two different materials that are in contact. Thirdly, the Thomson effect refers to the increase or decrease of temperature in a conductor with a temperature gradient through which a current is passing. And finally, fourthly, thermoelectric effects which are a generic way of calling all the previous cases. The only difference being that, in the first ones, reference is made to the scientists who discovered each phenomenon, Thomas Johann Seebeck, Jean Peltier and William Thomson, the latter being also known as Lord Kelvin. Let's start analyzing the Seebeck effect, since chronologically this was the first to be discovered. More specifically, in the year 1821, Seebeck realized that by positioning two plates of different metals welded at their ends, that is, forming a closed circuit and positioning a compass between them, it varied its direction if a heat source was applied at one of the ends. And not only that, when performing the reverse action, using ice or some other element at low temperature, the direction in which the compass was pointing was also reversed. Initially, Seebeck assumed that the temperature generated a polarization in metals, which produced a magnetic field directly, but as we have already seen in several previous episodes, this behavior is related to the experiment of Hans Christian Ersted performed just a year earlier, in 1820, in which he demonstrated empirically that an electric current passing through a wire was able to affect the direction of the magnetized needle of a compass by generating a magnetic field. To understand what is happening in this system and why an electric current is generated by creating a temperature gradient, we must first understand how electric charges move through a conductive material under normal conditions. Conductive materials such as metals are able to transmit electricity because they have charge carriers that can move freely through them, the most common being electrons, negatively charged subatomic particles. Although there are also positive charge carriers, which we will talk about later. If we have only one piece of metal and nothing else, the electrons could move freely. But since in general the composition is relatively homogeneous, they will tend to equilibrium and there will be no current. However, if we connect two different conductive materials, the electrons will tend to move towards one of them, due to their different chemical compositions generating a potential difference which in turn generates an electric current. Just like in Luigi Halvani's experiment that we saw in the video on how batteries work. Unfortunately, with only two metals, this electric current will not last long, because the electrons will not be able to keep moving and the set will quickly come to equilibrium. Now, if we close the circuit, when we connect the metals in both ends, nothing will happen either because the potential difference generated in the second end will be of equal value to the first one, but with the opposite sign. That is, the circuit will have a net voltage equal to zero, and there will be no current. By increasing the temperature of one of the junctions, we will be delivering more energy to the free electrons of each material, while increasing the potential difference that existed between them. Therefore, now that one of the ends will have a greater potential difference, the net voltage of the circuit will be different from zero and a current will be generated. Due to this behavior, the Seebeck coefficient appears, which is an intrinsic property of each material, but is usually expressed as a value relative to a second material such as platinum, because as we saw, two different materials are needed to generate the effect. The unit of measurement of the Seebeck coefficient is the microvolts per degrees Kelvin, 
and helps us to calculate what voltage we should get as a result depending on the temperature difference between the two ends. This coefficient does not have a linear behavior, but for certain materials and temperature ranges this simplification can be made. Now that we know how to generate electricity using just two pieces of metal, we are ready to build our own thermoelectric generators. Unfortunately, as I already mentioned, the Seebeck coefficient is usually measured in microvolts per degrees Kelvin, so we would need a lot of pairs connected in series or a large temperature difference between the two ends to generate just a few millivolts. But that does not mean that we cannot take advantage of this phenomenon, as we will be able to relate a temperature difference with the generation of a voltage. And therefore, if we position one end in a place with a known temperature and the other end in a place with an unknown temperature, we can know its value by measuring the voltage generated dividing it by the Seebeck coefficient of the pair of materials, and adding the reference temperature. These temperature measuring devices are known as thermocouples. In fact, they are quite common and chances are you can find some of these in your own homes, as control devices in other products whose temperature varies. If you ever want to use a thermocouple, some of the properties you should consider are its sensitivity to temperature differences, which is directly related to the Seebeck coefficient of the pair, because the higher it is, the easier it will be to measure differences in voltage that we can later relate to a temperature. The temperature ranges at which they can be used, since each material has different melting points and therefore will melt above certain temperatures, as well as certain characteristics that limit their operation at extremely low temperatures. And finally, the specific range in which we need more precision, since, as I mentioned before, the Seebeck coefficient does not have a linear behavior over its entire functional range. Now, before moving on to talk about the Peltier effect and Peltier cells, I want to make a small digression about another device for measuring temperature that is also composed of a couple of different metals, but works in a completely different way, and that's why I don't want you to confuse them. I'm talking about bimetallic foils. The principle of its operation is quite simple. If we put two sheets of different materials together and heat them, since they will have different coefficients of thermal expansion, one of them will expand more than the other, causing the set to bend to one side. And if we exaggerate this effect by winding the sheet in the shape of a spiral, we can create a temperature control system in which the passage of electricity depends on the angle of one of the ends. More specifically, we can position a glass container with two wires and a small amount of mercury, which is a metal capable of being in a liquid state at room temperature. Therefore, when the temperature is low and the foils are contracted, the mercury stays on the opposite side of the wires and the current cannot pass between them. While on the other hand, when the temperature is higher, the spiral expands and the mercury moves towards the wires, closing the circuit and allowing the electric current to pass through. With that out of the way, we are ready to talk about the Peltier effect, which acts in the opposite way to the Seebeck effect. That is, if we use again a pair of metals joined at the ends, whose temperature is equal everywhere, and we make a current pass through them, one of the ends will start to increase its temperature while the other will start to decrease. This is because, when electrons pass from one material to the other, the energy they had before and after are different, which goes against the law of conservation of energy, at least until we include heat as a variable. If an electron passes from a state of more energy to one of less energy, this loss of energy is not actually being lost, but transformed into heat, which increases the temperature of the junction. In a similar way to how light-emitting diodes work, on the other hand, if an electron goes from a lower energy state to a higher energy state, it needs to get that energy difference from somewhere, and as you can imagine, it gets it from the heat that previously existed in the junction, reducing its temperature.
In theory with this alone we could already build our cooling system however we will still have two problems in our way. The first is the joule effect, which tells us that when a current passes through a conductor, this dissipates energy as heat commensurate to the voltage and current passing through the conductor, which in practical terms generates a contradiction. Because if we want to increase the thermal gradient we need more current, and the current generates more heat in the system. And I wish it were as simple as that. Remember the Thomson effect which I mentioned at the beginning? It said that when a current passed through a conductor with a temperature gradient there was an increase or decrease in the temperature of the conductor. So if, for example, we had a series of metal pairs to amplify the effect, three things would happen at the same time. First, by the Peltier effect, one end will increase its temperature while the other end will decrease it. Second, by the Joule effect, the whole system will dissipate energy in the form of heat. And finally by the Thomson effect, because the current moves through temperature gradients that are reversed each time they pass through a junction, it will alternate periodically between sections that increase and decrease temperature. But that's not all. If you thought we were done with the problems, that was only the first one. Even if we manage to reduce the Joule effect and the Thomson effect, to turn this into a viable product we would have to optimize the use of materials. And the easiest way to do this would be to reduce the intermediate sections, since ultimately the temperature transfer is generated only at the junctions between the two materials. Unfortunately, by doing this we will reduce the distance between the ends, and since metals, besides being good electrical conductors, are usually also good thermal conductors, the temperature gradient that we are trying so hard to create will not last long as the system will tend to equilibrium quickly. The missing piece that made it possible to solve this problem was semiconductors because they have two very interesting characteristics. The first one is that they can be doped, a process in which by including impurities their internal structure can be altered to create n-type semiconductors with an excess of electrons and p-type semiconductors with a lack of electrons or simply holes. The interesting thing about this is that both electrons and holes are charge carriers but with opposite signs. This means that the thermoelectric effects are also reversed. And the second characteristic is that a semiconductor can be both a good electrical conductor and a bad thermal conductor. Considering all of that, it was possible to create a device like this, commonly known as a Peltier junction or Peltier cell, in which we will have an N-type semiconductor and a P-type semiconductor in the internal part, plus metal plates at the top and bottom, all connected in series. By applying a potential difference, the upper part will increase its temperature while the lower part will decrease. But let's analyze the path of a single electron as it passes through this system, paying special attention to the junctions between materials. For this we are going to rely on a diagram with the energy level of the electron along its path. When the electron is passing through the metal, it will have a certain amount of energy that we will use as a reference. When passing to the n-type semiconductor, since it will have an excess of electrons, our electron will have to move through higher energy orbitals so that it can pass through, and as we mentioned before, to compensate for this increase of energy in the electron, the material decreases its temperature. Later, when it reaches the second junction, the opposite will occur, the electron will pass to a state of lower energy in the metal and to compensate it will increase the temperature. Then, when passing from the metal to the p-type semiconductor, since it has a lack of electrons, our electron will need less energy to pass through it. That is, again, heat will be generated as a result. And finally at the last junction, the electron will pass to a more energetic state when entering the metal, decreasing its temperature to compensate for the change. In this case always use as a reference the movement of an electron, but remember that it is completely valid to represent the movement of the charges in the p-type semiconductor as if they were positive and moving in the opposite direction, which is probably what you will find on the internet if you do some research on the subject. As you can imagine, based on everything we have seen so far, a Peltier cell can act in four different states, generating two different thermal gradients depending on the polarization of the voltage source that is being used, and generating two potential differences with opposite signs depending on the thermal gradient applied to the ends of the cell.
However, this design also has other benefits. Given the characteristics of semiconductors, they have much higher Peltier and Seebeck coefficients than other materials, which makes them much more efficient, either to generate thermal gradients or to generate electricity. In addition, since the semiconductors used are poor thermal conductors, we will have an insulating layer between the sections in which we do want to modify their temperature, allowing the development of much more compact designs than if we used only metal. And finally, it is possible to make arrays of hundreds of these cells connected electrically in series and thermally in parallel to further enhance their performance. However, if we want to use them to reduce the temperature of another component, we will need to include a heatsink in the section that will increase its temperature, because although semiconductors work as thermal insulators, at a certain temperature they will no longer be as effective. In general, if we compare Peltier cells with respect to other cooling methods, the truth is that they are not as efficient, however, they are compact, have no moving parts, which means a lower probability of failure, and also can reverse its operation without major complications which together can make them perhaps the only viable option for some particular cases. And the same applies if we wanted to use them as a power generation device. There are much more efficient methods to generate electricity, but for extremely particular cases this may be the only option. For example, generating electricity for a flashlight using only the difference in temperature between the environment and the user's hand or powering a satellite like Voyager that must operate in space for 50 years at distances so far away from our sun that even photovoltaic cells would not be useful. More specifically, Peltier cells are an essential component of radioisotope thermoelectric generators used in space missions. But we will see that in a future video. This video required many hours of research and animation, so if you think it's worth it I remind you that you can support me through Patreon, with which I can hire help in the research stages or by 3D models like this, which ultimately translates into more videos and with better quality, plus other benefits. That's all for now and see you in the next video.